Tell everybody what you do, by the way. Like, what industry are you in? What do you do out yeah. there? So we're in, I'm in the automotive industry. Uh, we deal with uh, special financing, but also financing for people, too, as well. I'm the uh, general manager of our online department that started basically when uh, COVID first hit last year, and around uh, February, March is when we signed up with you, too. Yeah. So, okay, so you're in the automotive industry, 401 Auto, you've got several dealerships there in, in Canada, kind of all over the place. Yeah, 18 of them now, yeah. Yeah, 18 of them now. And then you, when you first started here, I believe, I want to say about four to six weeks later is when the coronavirus just kind of boom happened, right? Yeah. Now, you're a car dealership. Yeah. Your country closes down. Yeah. And they say, you can't have people come in the doors to buy cars. You have to close your doors. Yeah. What was going on in your mind as the general manager yeah. when you heard that? Well, actually, at first, I was just a, a finance manager before, uh, you know, when I reached out to you guys. Yeah. And there was a little bit of panic. Like we were, we, you know, the dealerships were going to have to be shut down. So actually, uh, the owner of our company actually called everybody in and just wanted him to patrol the the area to make sure no one was breaking into our trailers and cars and things like that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there was a there was a little bit of panic, and yeah. then once we found out, you know, we could do this remotely, that's when the doors kind of opened up to you know obviously selling everything online. Yeah, yeah. So we had to make you had to make a transition, right? So your doors are closed, people can't come in. Obviously, yep. that's going to affect business. And yep. this was right in the beginning when we were starting to train you and your teams how to tie in any PQ to what you sell. I know that I personally wrote out your sales structure with you with another couple of managers, yep. and we started to implement it like boom right at the time of the coronavirus. Now. Uh, let's talk about before you got into any PQ, like how were you, and I see a picture of me back there. That's crazy. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a video. Videos going on. What's going on back there? Uh, throughout our, so I have an arena um, with, you know, 50 salespeople or finance managers in here right now because we're all online. Yeah. So we have, you know, six or seven TVs with all, with all your training material on it. So they're just 100% immersed in any PQ and seventh level when they yeah. walk into the, uh, to the arena. Why have you done that with your team? Um, what switch to well no just have that like have them immersed oh. in the materials oh. I just I want them I want them living it like I want them fully like drinking the Kool-Aid so yeah. they really buy into everything because when they buy into everything yeah. that's when the results really start to come but if they're yeah. questioning things and yeah. if this is going to work and anything like that then you, you kind of see it in the results it doesn't really result in a lot of sales but yeah once we actually have them fully immersed into any PQ with, you know, yeah. the tonality, the pauses, the right questions at the right time, yeah. that's when you see their sales just skyrocket. Well, it's a hundred percent. You've got it, you know, like your, your company, there's some other companies that we have where they have these sales floors where they just have all these like, videos of the training going, you know, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have their salespeople listen to it in their cars while they're driving around. So they become so immersed in it that they start to speak the language of it, if that makes sense. So they understand like what questions to ask, when to ask them, why you're asking. It's not just the questions. You have to understand why you're even asking them in the first place. Yeah. Like, what are you looking for? What emotionally is it doing to the, the potential customer when you're asking those questions? Now, let's go back before you even knew anything about NEPQ, before you yeah. got involved in any of our training. Yeah. How were you and your people taught how to sell? It was it was basically, you know, you call the customer and say, hey, this is, you know, so-and-so from 401 Auto. We yeah. have a great approval for you. And, you know, the banks are really interested in working with you. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to come down here today before the banks, you know, pull the approval and we don't have that approval anymore. And it was just kind of like that takeaway close. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> before COVID, obviously. And, and our, our, you know, our, our appointment show rates were very, very low. Yeah. Uh, and we were trying to figure out how can we get more people into the dealership. Yeah. So that's when, you know, I so basically you were saying like, hey, you know, the bank's going to approve you. But, you know, if you don't get down here by, you know, within eight hours, they're mm -hmm. going to pull the approval. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you guys going over that with us and actually showing me those scripts. And I'm like, I, I, th I think I simply just asked you, like, when you say this to your prospects mm -hmm. and just be real with me, put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Do you believe that most of these people actually believe that? 
no. Plus, other dealerships are contacting them with approvals too, as well. So yeah. So when we say those type of things, like the urgency, and like we just tell them, like my manager's not going to approve this, or the bank's not going to approve you if you do, if you come in tomorrow, and we think it's building urgency, it might do that with a few desperate people. Yeah. But for the most part, the most people that are going to qualify the most, the more sophisticated people, all that does is create a lack of trust because yeah. they know that's not true. And when they don't trust you, are they actually going to show up? No, no not at all. And I remember your guys' your guys's show up rates. Like what were the percentage of show up rates before we started implementing and training you? It was low. It was, you know, in the in the almost single digits, like below 10%. Okay. And then when we started training you, and you've yeah. started implementing NEPQ, what did those show up rates start start to go up to? Uh, initially, like they, they definitely increased like probably yeah. double, like yeah. uh, 20, 30, 40%, but then COVID hit. So then we switched everything to to online for my team. I can't speak for our, our other dealerships. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we switched everything to online, obviously. But our second phone calls, I can say almost everybody answers on our second phone calls. And we're at, we're probably right now having about 85, 90% commit on the second phone call, which yeah. is crazy. <laughs> a little bit better than 10%. A little bit better. 10% to 85%, a little bit better. Because if you have that many more people like replying, now they can't come in right now to your dealerships because you're in Canada and you're all locked down. So you have to, I think, set up special appointments for them to like come in. But you're making records even during COVID. Now, other dealerships that you know of that just sell the way car salespeople are always taught how to sell, yeah. how are they doing in the pandemic days? A lot of them aren't selling. Like I, I've hired a few people, like really, really good finance managers from other dealerships that yeah. uh, just basically told me, like, I took, I've took i taken two months off because we haven't sold a car at all so <laughs> i always kind of count our blessings and say how fortunate we are to be able to do this every day and, and break records every you know every month which is crazy sure. well let's let's break down the sales process so you sure. connect so yeah. before uh okay so you're setting records you're setting records during covid which is just crazy right because yeah. of any pq your show up rates are just massively high even during freaking lockdowns which yeah. like i said I, I find like how is this even possible now let's talk about the connecting part. So when yeah. these leads come in, are they inbound leads who book on the counter or just outbound leads that you're having to reach out to? No, they're inbound. So we actually have a lead generation uh, company within our company. Yeah. And uh, so what happens is, is we'll get the lead and then one of my finance managers will get sent that lead and then the finance manager reaches out to that lead. Yeah. So they reach out to the lead and typically how are we, you know, I don't have your sales structure pulled up in, yep. in front of me because I'm on a smaller screen today yep. in the office, but typically how are your, how, how do we teach your reps how to connect? What were the first questions out of their mouth and why were we asking those questions? So, you know, what we'll do with the connecting questions is, you know, we just ask them, you know, first thing we'll start off with is, you know, they recently requested some information. It looks like you know, yesterday afternoon about possibly getting financing for a vehicle yeah. and just that neutral language there already like you know, disarms that uh, that person like they feel comfortable yeah. with us just with that yeah. um, and then they'll say something like oh yeah hey how you doing and then yeah let's uh, talk about that for a second so yeah. why do we want to use the word possibly when we're calling inbound or outbound leads and, and Marty hit it right on the head is because it's neutral okay when we call the lead like you used to Right. And you just, I, what, what did you used to say? You like assume they wanted it or something or what? I can't remember. Yeah. What you used to yeah, it's exactly. Like we have a, you know, we have an approval for you. When can you get down here? Like we just assume they haven't even bought anywhere either. Like we haven't even asked that question. <laughs> sure. So you're yeah. like, assume, 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 and then hardly anybody shows up. So yeah. when we say, looks like you, you know, booked on the calendar about, it looks like you'd replied to an ad, you know, a couple of days ago about possibly getting, you know, financing for a, a new car or whatever. When we use the word possibly, what that does is it removes any sales pressure from the start of that call. And what we have to all understand, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, what your products or services are, in the first 10 seconds of any sales interaction, whether it's on the phone, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's in person, it does not matter. Your prospects subconsciously, this is just the way our brains work, are picking up on verbal and nonverbal cues based on your tonality and what you are saying and or asking that trigger their brain to respond in one of two ways. Now, if you don't know the right questions and the right tone to use, okay, 
what happens is a lot of leads that you talk to, it triggers them to feel like you're just trying to sell them something. And so it triggers them to want to get rid of you. Well, we don't really need that. Or, you know, I'm too busy right now. Or, you know, we've looked at it and we'll do it later. Can you, you know, we don't are, you know, your prices are too high. We don't, we're not interested. And they try to get rid of you. Now, if you know the right questions, if you understand NEPQ, like we train you in our, in our virtual training programs, our, our uh, courses in our, in our group trainings that we have for our clients, like Marty and his company, then what that does is it triggers their brain to become so curious that they feel like they have to engage with you, that they feel like if they don't engage with you, they're missing something very important, right? Now, once you get, let's keep going. So after that first couple of questions, where are you going in that conversation? What are you wanting to find out? Uh, we still go for the connecting question. So I'm going to ask something like, you know, have they found what they're looking for yet to even figure out if we can even help them in the first place? Yeah. Um, and why do we, why do we teach you how to ask that question? We don't want to, you know, if, if the person's already bought something, we don't want to go over our whole entire script that they've bought something and then have them tell us at the end, oh, I already bought something and it's... You know, already bought something yesterday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know why you guys are calling me. Yeah. So it's on those outbound leads. A lot of times we're saying now, have you, um, you know, after the first connecting question now, have you, have you found what you're looking for or... Or are you still looking? And we pause there, right? Now, why do we want to have that pause there rather than just saying it really quick? Um, pauses really, really help. It makes it it makes it seem like you're more of a human. It's not like a robotic scripted anything like that. But it also it also helps them kind of process what you're asking. Like if you're asking it too quick, I find we get like a lot of reactionary answers. Mm. Where if it's slower, it helps them process what you're asking. You get a more thought provoked answer. Yeah, and when we get them to think deeper about the questions we ask, that pulls out more pain and more feelings and more emotions. Yeah. When we just say a question real quick, it's like you going into the mall and you're looking to buy a pair of jeans and the salesperson comes over and says, how can I help you? And you just say, just looking, because it's a knee jerk question that is getting you a knee jerk reaction. So that's why we teach that verbal pausing in a lot of your questions to get them think to think deeper. Okay, so they say that, yeah, you know, we're looking for possible a car, financing, blah, 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 blah. And yep. then at that point, you jump into what we call situation questions. What are you looking for in your situation questions? Uh, basically what, you know, what cars are driving now, uh, what type of vehicle they're looking to get into, yeah. uh, you know, how long have they had the type of, of vehicle yeah. that they have now. So just anything basically to find out what kind of situation they're in, even if it's something to do with like credit, let's say too, as well, you yeah. know, do they know what their credit situation is? Anything that kind of just paints the overall picture for us of, you know, why this person's you know, contacted us. Yeah. So you're, you're finding out like with situation questions, you're finding out the basic facts of what their current situation is, right? Yeah. So what do they drive now? How long have they been driving it? Uh, what got them into that car? Um, those questions kind of help them also realize maybe that they don't, they've had this car for a long time or whatever, and they don't really like it. Right. Yeah. So it helps them see how long they've had the situation. Now, one thing we also have to understand, this is for everybody, every industry, doesn't matter. Most of your prospects, when you first originally talk to them, don't even know they have a problem, right? Do they just come to you and be like, oh my gosh, Marty, thank you, dear yeah. Lord, for calling me. I have been waiting. I have so many problems with my car. I'm ready to sign up. How many people say that? No, a lot of times we actually have people try to like brush us off a little bit. And then yeah. we start asking the right questions and then they start opening up. And then once they open up and really pull that emotion out with our, you know, our problem awareness, solution awareness questions, yeah. then it's like the floodgates are open with, with the, you know, the pain points and things like that. Yeah. So it's really cool. Yeah. So, okay. So then we're, we're finding out their present situation. They're finding out their present situation. They're starting to realize that they have problems. Maybe they didn't even think they had before they were on with you 10 minutes earlier. Right. And we're a, when we're able to help them visually see in their mind, that not only do they have one problem, but now they have two or three or four other problems they didn't even realize, that causes them to view you and your company as the trusted authorities, the experts in your market, the go-to company. Now, at this point, we found out their situation. We want to then dive into finding out what their problems are, yeah. what the root cause is, and then yeah. how it's affecting them. What, what question do we train you? What questions do we train you how to do that in the problem awareness stage? So they'll tell us something that, you know, why they're looking for a vehicle. Let's say they want a, you know, a larger SUV. So yeah. we'll ask a question like, so 
besides a larger SUV, do you do you like what you're driving now? Yeah, and how did they respond to that? Uh, a lot of people will be like, I don't really like it, or yeah, it's okay. And then if they have like kind of a hesitation, I'll say, well, hold on, you don't sound so sure about that. You got to do that there. Uh, sorry, my phone's going off right now. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> uh, teach us the... Uh, yeah, why don't we teach you how to ask that question? So that tonality is very important oh. when we ask that problem. Where so yeah. with the car that you have oh, yeah. now, do you do you like what you're driving or, or whatever the problem awareness yeah. question was? Now, why would we want to... It's the same thing. We pause there Guess because it forces them to think deeper about what we're asking. Yeah. Right now, before you learned that in yeah. EQ, how did, what how did you what did you even say to find out what their problems were in your old sales process? Didn't even find out. It was just like, yeah, we'll get you approved. We can solve all your issues. It's like, well, what are the what are the issues to begin with? <laughs> just, you know, we thought our product was the absolute best. The approvals we had were the absolute best because we had the best relationships with lenders. Just kind of went into that you know feature advantage benefit pitch, yeah. and uh, you know got a ton of. And how would uh, most people respond to that? a ton of objections and rejections. Like we actually had scripts on ha how to handle the objections and rejections that we were gonna get. <laughs> so the the way you were taught how to sell was yeah. triggering resistance and objections, the yeah. way you were saying it and the questions yeah. you asked. Yeah. And then you had to learn objection handling techniques to overcome what you just triggered with the prospect. Yeah. <laughs> I love that type of training, it makes so much sense. I'm just yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, okay, so you got a lot of objections, you got a lot of resistance. Now, yeah. once we implemented these problem awareness questions, mm -hmm. what started happening with the resistance? Uh, reduced quite a bit. Yeah. Um, What's up back there? There's somebody looking back there. That's the vice president of our company. <laughs> oh, hey, vice president, nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, uh, it started just almost eliminating resistance completely. Yeah. Uh, and they were really opening up. And now what happened was, is they were just, they were just answering our questions. Yeah. So there really couldn't be any objections to the own, the, their own answers. <laughs> and that's what we started to find, right? We're like, okay, well, this is, this is a lot easier even to contact yeah. people now. Yeah. So it's much easier to sell when you get a lot less objections, right? Because yeah. The more objections you get, I hate to say you, there, there's a myth out there that, oh my gosh, the more objections you get, that somehow they're more interested. Yeah, the more Nothing they care. could be further from the truth, yeah. right? Because think about all the sales you lost where they had tons of objections. Yeah. Right? Think about the laydowns you made that had zero objections. Yeah. It's better to have hardly any objections, right? So we taught you certain questions to ask in your sales process with NEPQ that really yeah. prevented objections from even happening in their mind. Right now, they do have some objections at the end. We help, you know, help you overcome them. Hey, guy with the red shirt, nice to meet you, whoever that was. All right. So problem awareness questions. You've helped them find out what their problems are, how the problems are affecting them, the rationale questions. Then you yep. move into your solution awareness questions. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what solution awareness questions we have you start out with, with your company. So we just want to find out if they've done anything to actually solve uh, this issue now that they've they realize what they have. So so before you started talking to me, were you out there looking for other vehicles so that you didn't have to, you know, pay the two thousand dollars a month you're currently paying on you know, maintenance and things like that? Yeah. And just kind of pull in what their pain was into that solution awareness question. Right now. The reason why we have to learn solution awareness questions is because it involves the other prospect and the prospect and what they've done in the past to help solve the problem, which for a lot of people, they start to realize that they really haven't done anything about the problems that they didn't even know they had. Right. So that causes them to take ownership of their own problems. Yeah. Now, when you're able to ask the questions that get the prospect to own their problems, that means they become attached to solving those problems because as a human being, we want to do what? Get away from pain. Yeah. That's how we're wired. If you don't understand those questions, you don't get them attached to their problems and there's no urgency for them to do anything. That's why if you're getting a lot of, I wanna think it overs, we don't have the money, I need to think, I need to talk with my spouse about this more, I need to talk to my uncle, my aunt, my great grandmother, Betsy, the man in the van down by the river. If you're getting a lot of those objections because you haven't learned NEPQ and solution awareness questions that get them to attach to the need of wanting to solve that. Now, before you learn all that from us, yeah. 
how were you, what were you doing in that part of the sales process? That would probably be just more, you know, what we can do for them, how we can get them the best rates and build their credit and, you know, get them the vehicles that they're looking for. And just, again, yeah. trying to keep going into that pitch, 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 pitch. Yeah. And, and you could just feel them even on the phone, like starting to draw more away. And like, it's almost like they weren't even paying attention anymore. And then they would say something like, yeah, yeah okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll book an appointment just to kind of like induce the act of reciprocity. Just get us off the phone, right? It'll give us yeah. something to get off so the they phone. they treated you almost like a telemarketer. Yeah, 100% exactly that's, what it was. That's what they did. That's why you got less than 10% would actually show up compared to now getting 85% that show up. Completely yeah. different scenario. Now they're owning the problem. So they're actually coming in to want to solve the problem with you rather than some other car company who might give them the same rates or have the same type of deals, but they don't have the same trust as they do with you because other salespeople from other companies don't know how to pull out the feeling side and the internal side and the emotion yep. side like your team does. Now, also solution awareness questions, as you know, are very important because now that we understand what their current state is, their current situation from our situation and problem awareness questions, solution awareness questions help them see and internalize where they want to be, what their objective state yep. is right? Why is it so important for them to also not only understand the problems they have now and how it's affecting them, but also be able to see where they want to be and how that's going to make them feel? Why is that so important internally for them? It just makes them feel good. Like, like knowing that, okay, where they are now isn't the end. Like we can actually help them get to that point where they, where they want to go if they follow the steps and everything, you know, that the solution that we provide, it's, yeah. Just like, um, you know, it's almost like when Tony Robbins, you know, when he does his, his a couple of his things where it's like, here's where you are. But if you keep doing this, you can get to here and people all believe and in, internally buy into that. Right. Yeah. And that's what right there. It's when they've or now they've convinced themselves, they've persuaded yeah. themselves essentially to to want to get to that point. Yeah. And now we're just, you know, again, like you said, we're the trusted authority helping them guide to that point now. Yeah. So they've persuaded themselves that they have all these problems they didn't even know they had 12 minutes ago before you're on the phone with them. And now they've internalized that they have to do something about solving those because you've helped them relive the pain, whether that's paying too much money for gas. So they need a smaller car, whether that's they need a bigger car because they want to go hiking and now they're stuck at home with their Prius. I and mean, there's so many different things yep. that they could be looking for and problems they have in your space since you sell cars. Now, after they've realized, here's where I want to be, here's where I am, yep. here's where I want to be, what's the gap in the middle? All those problems yep. that you're questioning has helped them see that they really have. And the bigger that gap from your questioning ability, the more likely they are to purchase. The smaller the gap, because if you can't open them up, if your questions are off, if you don't understand an EPQ, if you just ask regular consultative questions that you learn out in just generalized courses, the smaller the gap means the less likely they are to buy. And that's yep. what triggers a lot of objections. Now, at that point, we move into consequence questions yep. and consequence questions like rip that dream away that yep. they just said they have to have. What yep. consequence question do you, do you have? Do we have your team ask there? Yeah. So they'll, they'll, you know, they'll, we'll go for the solution awareness and, you know, what they're actually looking for. And then they'll be all psyched about it, all really happy about it. I was like, well, well, hold on. What if, what if you don't do anything about this though? And you keep having the same issues with the car breaking down and you actually costing you money at work for the next three, six, even 12 months. And how do they respond to that? I would, I can't do it. If you can't help me, then, then I'll go somewhere else. And they start like panicking a little bit. And then that's when we're like, oh, okay, so what's important for you to do something then. Yeah, it's really important. Okay. And that's what I needed to hear because and then we go in our transition. Right. Yeah. So after we've got them to realize here's their current situation, their problems, where they're at now, we don't tell them that. We ask questions that allow them to see that in their mind, which is powerfully persuasive. You tell them it's in one ear, out the other, because it's coming from you. Right. Then we get them to through suits and awareness questions where they see here's where they want to be. This is their objective state and how it's going to make them feel once all these problems are solved. And then the consequence question like rips it away where they're like, no, no, I have to have this. And they pull you back in. No, 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 no. I'm going to do something about it. OK, so it's important for you to do something. Then. That's that's what I really needed to know, because based on what you told me and then we transition. Yep. Right. See how that works now before. You learned NEPQ and consequence questions. What would you ask there to try to 
get them to realize the consequences if they don't do anything. <laughs> didn't even know about it. Like, I but I, I just say, okay, if I could get you this price, like, would you buy the car? <laughs> like, would if you, we could get you the best deal possible, yeah. would you buy today? Yeah, yeah, exactly. How did people respond to that? Uh, well, I gotta, you know, I gotta talk to my wife or we're just kind of, we're kind of looking right now, but you know, send us, send us your best rates and your best quotes and you know, we'll get back to you. Yeah. And they commoditized you. Yeah. See how that works. And then they start competing with you on price, right? Okay. Now we transition into your presentation. How have you structured the presentation differently than you've done it in the past before any PQ? So first for the transition. So we have a, like our presentation are you talking about tr transition or presentation phase? Well, the presentation. Like, yeah. how, how have we set it up a lot differently than what you had before you learned any PQ? So, when we call them back, we want to make sure that we're still on the same page because, you know, we have to work on the approvals and and everything like that. So, we ask them, you know, you know uh, just want to make sure we're still on the pa same page. On the last phone call, we talked about, you know, this. Are we still on the same page? Yes. Okay. So, based on what you told me, uh, you know, like I said, we do have some options that would work for you because you know how you said, and then whatever issue they told us versus right. what they want yeah and because of that it's it's causing you to feel i think you said maybe a little bit of stress sometimes why do we teach you to like even though they said in the call that they were frustrated or annoyed yeah. or stressed or burdened or whatever because the questions that we taught you have brought that out of them where they felt they opened up and really told you how they feel yeah. they didn't hold anything back to you why do we say at that at the end of that? It, I think it's caused you. Uh, I think you'd mention a little bit of stress sometimes. Why would we say a little bit? Because you want to downplay it because they'll upplay it. No, not a little bit of stress, man. Like I am stressed, or a little bit of stress. Like, dude, this is causing me so much stress. And now they're telling themselves. We're not telling them. They're yeah. telling themselves how stressed. Yeah, because if we go into that and we say, I think you'd mention it's caused you a lot of stress. Well, a lot of people say, well, it's not that bad. Yeah. They say the exact opposite, but when you yeah. downplay it and you say, I think it's caused you, I think you'd mention a, a, a little mm -hmm. bit of stress sometimes. Oh my gosh, you have no idea the stress, yeah. right? And then they start to own it more, okay? And then with your presentation where you talk about problems they said they have yeah. and how each part of your specific solution solved each of those problems yeah. and other problems they didn't know they had, then that connects the dots and it justifies the pricing of what you're offering. Yeah. That makes sense? Yep, 100%. All right, so then you get to the end, you go through the presentation, yep. and then at the end, uh, at that point, yep. uh, you, you, know, you wanna ask what we call committing questions that get them to commit to take the next step to solve their problems. What committing yep. questions do we have you use? So we'll say something like, do you feel like this could be the vehicle to, to help you get your family to where you need to go safely or yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever the pain they told Whatever us. their pain oh, point was. Right. Yeah. And then how do they react to that? Uh, yeah, I really do. Well, why do you feel like it is though? Or why do you feel like that vehicle would be the solution for you? And why and, did we teach you how to ask that any probing question there? Uh, it's really powerful because again, they're again, telling themselves, but they're also selling us now. Like when I ask that question, they're like, oh man, like being able to travel and do this and do this and do this. And it brings back that like future pacing, that future dream that they're, they're they want to get to. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So they basically pull you in and almost fight like, no, 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 it's, it's for me because of X and Y and Z. Now, before you learned any PQ, yeah. how did you try to close? Um, you know, there was the, you know, the takeaway clothes, there was the fear, like, you know, fear of taking something away. There was, uh, honestly, I can't even, I can't even remember it cause I've reprogrammed my brain so much for any PQ <laughs> that I've tried to block all that. Do you want the there. red one or the blue yeah, one? Do yeah. The, uh, the tomorrow the at two or Thursday yeah. at five. The yeah. This something eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All that. All right. So, okay. So, uh, now, okay. So your closing ratios are up. Uh, yeah. big time high, even yeah. during lockdowns. Yeah. What are you predicting? Cause it, it, you know, probably lockdowns in Canada, I'm assuming are going to end in the next couple of months. I mean, yeah. good, good Lord. I mean, everybody's going to be vaccinated or, or had it. So they have herd immunity or something <laughs> by that point. Where do you feel your dealerships yeah. and your salespeople are really going to go from there when they can actually have people come to the store? Uh, we're, we're, we're still going to have our brick and mortar, but I believe, 
Um, I believe the bulk of our business now is going to come from online because we've proved that we can we can create that trust and become that trusted authority for a customer so powerfully on the phone that we don't actually need to spend the $10 million on brick and mortar stores. We can just fill an arena up with you know 100 people that can do this on the phone all day. Yeah. Yeah. And from what I understand, you guys are out there, uh, you know, basically trying to acquire tons of these dealerships now that have kind of gone out of business because of COVID because they don't know how to sell properly. Right. Where do you guys think you would be? And just be real with me. Where do you think you would be if the pandemic happened, you know, 14 months ago and you didn't know anything about any PQ and you were just selling the old traditional way of selling? Yeah. Uh, not where we are, that's for sure. I mean, I'd probably be a lot more stressed. My, I'd probably, my uh, retention would probably be a lot lower because people would be stressed and not making money. And yeah. I mean, I could tell you one story with one guy I have. Uh, he was a, uh, a service advisor before this. So we kind of had that, that service background. Yeah. You know, mo- most money he ever made before was $3,000 a month. Yeah. That guy embodies, I mean, embodies any PQ in seventh level, even when he's talking to me to ask me questions. Right. And uh, like that dude's making 12 to 15K a month, like clockwork every single month yeah. now. So we went from 3K a month to 15K a month. Has that changed his life possibly? Oh, 100% it has. Him and his kid. I mean, he's happy, he buys his kid every game system now. <laughs> like, yeah, during a pandemic. So yeah. even after the pandemic, probably going to make a lot more money yeah. as well because oh, yeah. more people in your country are going to have more money because yeah. right now a lot of them can't even work, right? Yeah. Any last, uh, hey, that was really helpful. I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to break down your sales process. You know, a lot of people come to us and they're like, Oh my gosh, we see all these testimonials because we have about five to seven new testimonials that people post in our Facebook groups every single day. So that's about 170 to 200 every month of new testimonials, about 3,000, a little bit over 3,000 hours, somewhere around that range in the last two years. And that's over hundreds of different industries. But we still get people, some people like, well, I know it works for this industry and that industry and this industry and that, but you don't know our industry. Like it's so hard to sell. Like, you know, you can't ask questions to our prospects. Like it's just not going to work for us. Yeah. What would you say to somebody like that? Cause you're, I mean, you're in car sales, completely different industry than a yeah. lot of people in our, in our training. For sure. Yeah. Uh, you got to get past that belief system. That's it's old school. Uh, you know, a lot of the reason that people don't do this kind of stuff is they just, it's comfort zones. You gotta, you gotta break past that comfort zone of asking the right questions. And if it just makes sense, like if you ask the right questions at the right time, you're going to get the right answers. Yeah. And I think that's right. You know, you, I think sometimes they just become comfortable with being uncomfortable because they, they don't know what they don't know. Right. So for us to get to any new level financially or spiritually or anything in our life relationship wise, we first have to do what we have to step outside our comfort zone. If we want to learn more advanced skills to make us more money as sales professionals and companies. Now I think I'm coming out sometime after the lockdowns possibly. Yeah, we're gonna get you down here as soon as uh, as soon as Canada opens up a bit here. <laughs> we're gonna have you train our entire. Uh, I, know, I think right now, if I fly up there, I, I had my uh, executive <laughs> assistant do some research, and she's like, "Well, when you fly up there, I think you have to stay in a hotel for like two weeks. Sure. Yeah, have to be quarantined. Then you have to fly back." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no. We're not going up to Canada <laughs> yet. I'm not staying in a hotel yeah. for two weeks." It's our, and then most of the people are getting COVID in the hotel. Apparently, <laughs> like. <laughs> like good. So Good Lord, I, you know, I, I love these guys up there, but I, I don't think yeah. I want to stay in a hotel for two weeks. You know, <laughs> all right, Marty, you're the man. We really appreciate the help. Uh, we love, I love all those uh, big Jumbotron TVs of the training in the background that you have there in the call center. Keep crushing it. Really excited to see what you guys do, even when the pandemic opens. I know you guys are setting company and industry records with what yeah. you do now with NEPQ yeah. and sales, but I know that that's probably going to even double from there after the pandemic for sure. Yeah. So I'm really excited to see the company go from 18 dealerships to 30 to 50 to 100. Maybe we'll even have dealerships down here in Missouri. I've been asking. Uh, Indianapolis, I'd love to get a dealership down there. I know <laughs> you want to move probably. Yeah. All right, my man. Thanks for being on. Appreciate it. Now, everybody else that's on here, if you want to join our private Facebook group, Sales Revolution, I'm going to have uh, Chris here on our team post the Sales Revolution Facebook group. I know we stream here on YouTube, my personal Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Sales Revolution Facebook group. So we got people all over on here. So Chris will post that. You can join that. You'll answer a couple questions, surveys, so we know what industry you're in. And then we tag you right when you join the group. 
and uh, we'll send you over a free 30 minute training on objection prevention, how to prevent objections from even having your prospects mind right when you join the group, give you that free training. Marty knows about that as well. Uh, thanks for being on tomorrow. We will go live in the Facebook group as well to answer any questions you have. I'm going to spend about 40 minutes in there answering your sales questions, what objections you get, how to resolve those, how to start up the calls, whatever questions you have, be in the Facebook group tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern. Thanks, Marty, to everybody. Said hi, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.